Jessica Strand, the events director, and I'm not related to the Bass family that owns this bookstore. Anyway, tonight I'm thrilled to introduce two of America's top political scholars, Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein. Tonight they will candidly discuss their provocative book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. Thomas Mann is an Averill Harriman Chair and Senior Fellow in the Governance Studies at Bookings Institute. Norman Ornstein is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and the author of the weekly column for a roll call called Congress Inside Out. The two will discuss their book and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Please welcome Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein. Thanks so much, Jessica. Uh, I'm Norm, and uh, uh, thank you for coming out on a rainy night. Um, uh, I just uh, actually came in from Los Angeles, where this morning it was 82 and foggy, uh, just like Clint Eastwood. Uh, uh, so uh, Tom and I have been uh, partners and colleagues in uh, both uh, analyzing the American political process and trying to help uh, change it for well over 40 years now. And we've never seen it this dysfunctional, uh, which is uh, what gave rise to both the writing of this book and the title of the book. Um, it's even worse than it looks, and the title is a deliberate one. Uh, it always looks bad. The system is not designed to look wonderful, efficient, pretty, and beautiful. Uh, you. you know, to use the old cliche, we don't expect to have uh, uh, people that we elect sitting around the campfire, uh, uh, either uh, literally or figuratively, uh, holding hands and singing kumbaya. Making laws is a contentious, difficult, rambunctious uh, process. It never comes easy. Um, so it never looks good, but this is worse. In the 43 years that we have been in Washington, immersed in the politics, uh, both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, we've never seen it this dysfunctional. Um, we wrote a book six years ago called The Broken Branch, How Congress is Failing America and How to Get It Back on Track. That was in many ways a lament to the institution that we have grown up with and loved uh, at the decline of the regular order, at uh, the, the fact that uh, Congress had lost its way was not performing its independent role, doing oversight, overseeing the executive branch in many other ways. Um, but we also, as we had done for the four decades that we've been following things, were very careful to lay blame where we thought it belonged and that included a significant amount across the board. Six years later, this is just so much worse and we decided that we had to be true to ourselves and in this case, we focus much more of the blame on one party uh, that we call an insurgent outlier. But fundamentally, this is a set of problems that has emerged over 40 or 50 years, some of it related to the dramatic regional realignment in American politics that changed our parties from being two that were in many ways broad tents that did encompass a wide range of viewpoints uh, and interests and that had substantial centers to one where now the parties are distinct and different and behave much more like uh, parliamentary parties. Uh, some of the problems are related to the dramatic technological changes that have also altered our culture. A culture that is now debased and coarsened to a degree where uh, not just in politics, but more generally, lying is no longer seen as something uh, that is an element of shame, which requires uh, punishment or approbation. But if you lie and you get caught in a lie, you double down on it. And uh, chances are pretty good you'll get your own cable television show uh, as a consequence. Or if you're a political figure, you'll get money flowing in, you'll get on television all the time, you may even be able to run for president. Uh, that combined with the dramatic changes in the money system and politics and many other things have created a dysfunction uh, that is alarming uh, and one that needs to be called out uh, and one that needs to have some focus on how we're going to change it. Problem solving 
for a long time at least was the coin of the realm. More and more people, leaders, and in many cases followers, understood that the reason that they wanted to come to political office and to public office was to solve important problems for a local area, state, uh, or the nation. Now problem solving has taken a back seat to short term political advantage and those who remain as problem solvers find that they're thwarted by a process where oftentimes the rules are misused like the filibuster in ways that uh, hasn't occurred before. Uh, the American public is understandably unhappy, uh, angry. Uh, they're angry at everybody in this process but don't quite know how to resolve it. In a parliamentary system we have parliamentary parties, but a system and a culture that just don't tolerate them. Parliamentary system, you know that a majority is going to act and it will have legitimacy in its actions even if you don't like them. And the minority will vociferously, vehemently oppose, but they're not going to be able to stop the actions. And the public knows that in a period of time, three, four, or five years, they're going to be able to hold accountable the actors. Here, we try to hold them accountable, and we've had three wave elections in a row, 2006, 2008, unusually both moving in the same direction towards Democrats, and then this massive counter-reaction in 2010. And now we're headed towards an election where once again, figuring out who to hold accountable becomes difficult. But if you don't hold accountable those who are not problem solvers, then we're gonna end up in even worse shape with a set of short-term, medium, and long-term problems that are greater uh, than we usually have uh, in the system. So we hope what we've provided is both a roadmap and a blueprint to how we got to this sorry state, and also some recipe, at least uh, with a set of options, to what we can do to get out of it, and with a strong admonition here that the problems are not just in the leaders, they're not just in the institutions, they're not just in the mass media, though there's plenty of that there, they're also in the voters. And with that, I'll turn over what to do about it to my colleague. So I'm responsible for the voters, uh, right, Norm? Yes. Thank you. This has been an extraordinary experience for Norm and I. We've been colleagues and friends and collaborators for many decades. We're, we work in Washington. We have enormous respect for our constitutional system. Uh, we have been champions of the Congress and as the first branch of government and, and have uh, defended it in the face of assaults of, uh, of all sorts. But we have come to the conclusion that there is almost a, a, a sort of there is a reality overwhelming our politics that is unspoken because it's impolite to, uh, to speak truth to a situation by people who, who, whose careers and jobs are built on being nonpartisan, being analytic and fair. Uh, we concluded that we are now in a situation uh, where one of our parties has really gone, become quite a radical party, not a conservative party, and in that its, it's, it's, it's ideological goals are striking uh, relative to the norm for our two parties, but more than that, it's become really strategically engaged in, in efforts to undermine the majority party. Now that's normal in a parliamentary system, but it's very complicated in our system because it can have a huge impact on the economy and the state of the country more, more generally. Um, Norm and I um, <coughs> sort of made a move that was controversial and has been. Uh, the initial article derived from the book uh, at the beginning of May it was published in the Post and went viral. It had a one and a half million hits on the piece. A clever editor entitled it, let's just say it, the Republicans are the problem. Um, that probably had something to do with uh, the reaction that people had. 
257,000 Facebook likes. I wasn't sure what that meant, but uh, my son explained it to me. Um, uh, lots of comments, lots of debate. We've never had an experience like that. We've, uh, in, in May, June, July, August, September, in five months we've sold 60,000 copies of this book. Nothing even close to our experiences in the past. We've, we've struck a nerve. Um, people know about it, talk about it. We travel all over the country and people come forward with our copies of the books. Um, some challenge us and that's good. We love that. Disagree with, uh, with our analysis, but there, there is this sense in the country that something's amiss, but they don't quite get it. What's amiss? And, and therefore, our sense is that many of the proposed solutions, let us all come together and be more civil to one another and do the right thing, uh, so almost does a disservice because it, it, it just ignores the reality of what's going on here. There, there is a, not just a permanent campaign, but a permanent war uh, at work here. And tr Barack Obama was either incredibly naive or cynical when he ran for president, promising to lead us to a post-partisan era. Bring us all together. That was his brand. I understand why he ran on it, but you know, it looks laughable now since the opposition party decided before his inauguration to to pursue a strategy of, uh, of killing anything, trying to kill anything he proposed, even if what he proposed were policies they had recently embraced themselves. Uh, uh, Romney care is a good example of that, uh, but there are many examples uh, of it. He's, if he's for it, we're against it. Um, again, if we were in a parliamentary system, it would be perfectly normal, but in a separation of power system like ours, in the aftermath of the worst financial and economic crisis since the 1930s, it, it makes for utter political dysfunction. Um, and that's the problem we face that we're in. Talking nice and holding hands won't get the job done. In our view, people have to smarten up. They have to see the nature of the problem. and. And if they continue to rely on divided party government, which in less polarized times can be productive, but in the current times are utterly destructive, then they're going to get more of what they don't want. So this is a, this is a book to talk straight to people in ways that make our lives more uncomfortable, uh, because now people view us sometimes with suspicion. Ah, these are these Washington ultra, ultra liberals. Uh, we never had anyone sort of even imagine that uh, 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 description of us until we wrote this book, and we've done many before this book. Uh, so it, uh, it's bracing, it's sober. Uh, uh, we, as Norm said, we try to be constructive in outlining ways in which through electoral reform or institutional reform we could improve the system, but, but in the end it really comes down to citizens uh, figuring out what's going on and taking a hold of it. And that means deciding which way you want to go, making a commitment and voting it straight down the ticket. And whatever you do, not sending to Washington people who despise politicians, because our town and our government and the framers uh, worked well because they were politicians. Uh, anyways, that's the story of our, uh, of our book. I don't want to, I'm grateful for you all coming out. And we'd love to, uh, 
to respond to any kind of comments or questions you might have. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've been in politics since 1963. I worked for the Gulf War campaign, was involved in the anti-war movement. I've also been involved in the drug legalization movement, the Tea Party, both well, occupied. And one thing I've, I've noticed that the, the political observers have not observed is that we as libertarians organize, have to organize the Ron Paul movement. And now that Ron Paul has done well in terms of quotas from people like Stuart Colbert and other political observers, we're now moving our attention to Gary Johnson. What we're intending to do is we want to achieve gridlock. We want to see Obama win, we want to see the Republicans continue to hold Congress, and then hopefully some more shaking will happen when we have the economic collapse in the next year or two, and then make our move. However, the observers have not noticed this, <laughs> That's an interesting set of uh, strategic goals. Um, you know, Gary Johnson actually is starting to get some traction in a few states, not surprisingly, including his native New Mexico. Um, I've joked for a long time that I actually secretly hoped that Romney would pick Ron Paul as his running mate because he's for legalization of drugs and legalization of prostitution and I just wanted to be at the victory party. Uh, but uh, there is a libertarian strain out there and that libertarian strain is at odds with the zeitgeist of the Republican Party as you saw with the reaction to Paul uh, during the primary campaign. Uh, Gary Johnson doesn't have quite the ability to capture attention that Paul has. But I also think that um, this is a movement that's very far from being able to capture a majority or even a plurality. And what we are concerned about at the moment is that uh, we could get gridlock, we could get an economic collapse. Uh, but it's not clear who will pick up the pieces or what will be left if we go to pick up those pieces. I think another question, an interesting one that remains, um, and one can imagine Gary Johnson uh, being a help to Mitt Romney in some states, New Mexico being one, being a hindrance in others. Uh, there's another independent candidate, Virgil Goode, in, uh, who's on the ballot in a number of states for the Constitution Party, who could actually complicate matters significantly for Romney if it's close in Virginia. Um, but none have uh, either created a different dialogue more generally or will do anything more than being spoilers. Part of what we've suggested in the book is we'd like to see preference voting in the United States where preference voting, where you can rank order your preferences and then uh, people who have a different set of views than those that encompass the two majority parties are not just spoilers but can actually <coughs> play an impact on the outcomes and that will have an impact on the two major uh, parties. Um, at the same time, we've got to confront a reality that we have a system where right now an independent movement is going to be a spoiler movement and uh, it's not going to be effective and we've got to operate with those two parties and try and make them operate in a fashion that will be more uh, efficient and effective. It's fascinating to observe countries that have say single member districts but multiple parties using preferential voting uh, like Australia, and of course there's elaborate negotiations between the major parties and the smaller parties uh, over the program, agendas, and so on. Where are you going to direct your preferences to in the, in the second way? And, and, and so instead of marginalizing those efforts, those parties, it, it gives them a way to play even in a system that doesn't have proportional representation. So I, I think that would be a healthy move um, in our politics. I will say the 
contemporary Republican Party is an odd coalition. They are economic libertarians, they are social fundamentalists, and they are neoconservative in their foreign policy. True libertarians like only one of those, uh, those three. Uh, uh, but it's interesting that most of them operate within the Republican Party if they don't work toward, uh, toward a third party. It's, you could say it's a coalition that's untenable, uh, especially because if you look at the demographic changes uh, coming uh, over the long haul, that that social fundamentalism is a real loser for for a major uh, a major political party, and uh, it's it's also the case that the largest projected growing segment of the population, the Latinos, uh, uh, had been very uncomfortable with the with the sort of real Americans, nativist uh, sentiment that, uh, that exists. So Republicans are gonna have to figure out a way to how to, how to grapple with this. It's, in some ways, it's more strange bedfellows on the Republican side than the Democratic side. Since you're with the American Enterprise Institute, I care with just asking you, do you think the economy get better in the near future or get worse? And how do you think that'll impact the presidential basis of the change in the economy? Okay, well, let me first say, I am uh, at AEI and I've been there for more than 30 years, um, but I, uh, I'm a bit of an outlier there, so you're not gonna get um, a, a kind of uh, dogma um, I'll give you an objective view of what I think uh, the state of the economy is. We're in a weak economy, it's obvious. Um, one interesting comment made by Ross Douthat, who's a conservative columnist with the Times, of course, uh, is that we may be in the middle of a new normal, as he put it, where people have accustomed themselves to kind of bumping along at the bottom. Um, and what would really hurt Obama would be if we started to dig into that bottom that people, and I think there's something to this, and Ron Brownstein, a very good analyst and columnist, has written that uh, when you look much more deeply into public opinion surveys, Americans, by and large, who may not be sophisticated in a lot of areas, but there is a deeper understanding that the economic troubles we have now were not caused by Barack Obama, have not been worsened by Barack Obama, they're complicated, they go back a number of years, some of it was triggered by things that happened in the Bush administration. Some of it is deeper structural changes going on in a global economy that's gonna make life different for all of us and means that our future is not gonna be quite what we might have projected if we were projecting ahead. And that nobody has easy answers to get us out of it in the short run. The danger for Obama in the next five weeks is things beyond his own control. And I've talked to a number of people who have been to Italy, Greece and Spain in the last few weeks and they don't come back with any hopeful signs. Uh, it may be that they've patched things to take us through to January, but you could also imagine something happening that could cause an economic shock in the next few weeks that has people believing that we've lost the new normal and we're sinking down again. At the same time, obviously, the world is a very unstable place, and there are lots of things that can happen that can go beyond the assassination of an ambassador and a couple of other Americans to something more significant that makes it look like we're losing control and that could cause a collapse in confidence. Um, so there are things in the world that are beyond America's control and there are things that lead us to believe that the economy is not gonna have the typical path of a typical recession, which we already know, uh, which is a significant rebound after a big downturn. It's well, going to be longer to come Obama back. If there were shops in France, we would well, that's why you can't say that, uh, you know, you could look at today and you could look at what in trade shows, what Nate Silver suggests, what all of the markets show, which is if the election were held today, the chances are between 70 and 80 percent generally that Barack Obama would win. But it's not over. Uh, things can happen. 
and I don't think debates are what will make a difference, but things in the world could happen that would shake people enough uh, that it could make a, 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 a have an impact. But over the medium term, and even over the short to medium term, there are decisions that are going to have to be made that are going to have to be done with a realization that there is no magic bullet, there is no short-term answer, and that we've got some significant structural problems ahead. And frankly, one of the things that uh, brought us a sense of urgency when we wrote this book is that we're looking at a number of structural and global issues here. Global issues which are such that, uh, well, just as one example, my wife's a lawyer in Washington, or big law firm, which is an international law firm, as many others, are now outsourcing a lot of their paralegal work to places like India. Before long, they're going to be outsourcing the work of the associates to places like India. Radiologists now, because you can send high-resolution x-rays in a matter of uh, a handful of seconds somewhere else in the world, are going to start to do a lot of that work abroad. So the jobs that we've had here that are high-value jobs are not going to be the same. And coping with that longer, pro larger problem, coping with the fact that with unemployment sustained at the level we have it now, large numbers of people just entering the workforce may go for several years without getting that first step on the ladder. And we know from a lot of research, their lives will never be the same. They will never reach the level they would have otherwise. These are big issues that require problem solving, and you cannot tolerate dysfunction. So in the short term, Barack Obama is in great shape as of today. Five weeks is still a long time for things to happen. But over a longer period of time, including right after the election, if we don't begin to find ways to bring function back to the political system, that road to something better than a pretty poor level of new normal is going to be a very difficult one. I. Uh basically agree with uh, what Norm has said, but I also uh, think it's fascinating to see even in this sort of difficult recovery, high unemployment, stagnant wages, uh, you are now seeing sort of signs of vitality, the wealth effect. Stock markets are up, the housing uh, uh, collapse has finally cratered and the market is is moving up. People have paid off a lot of their debts. The increase in consumer confidence has really been quite striking in the last uh, the last month or or so. Uh, Norm's right. Europe is a very unstable situation, but we still attract money from abroad for people who are willing to pay us to keep it, that is negative interest rates, giving us uh, freedom of operation that many other countries don't see. So I think one of the reasons Obama has moved ahead uh, decisively in the polls, both national and in the battleground states, is because people are feeling a bit better about uh, about the future and they think sort of keeping another four years of this effort makes more sense than cutting taxes more and shrinking government uh, and reducing uh, regulations. Uh, the problems we face are are huge but we've faced problems like this before. The question is whether as Norm said, we can get our political act together to deal with it, and our problem is, is that we have these parliamentary-like parties, one of which is vehemently oppositional, uh, operating in a, in a constitutional system that makes it very difficult for majorities to act. I think I could outline a program. We've seen the designs of it, produced by others that would set us on a more constructive course. I don't think American decline is inevitable, that the American dream is is lost. Uh, um, if, uh, if we can shed a little ideological extremism uh, and return to our problem-solving roots, uh, we might do fine. Uh -huh. You said you'd have a program. How would you 
Republican Party be moved from what it is now to what we want it to be? Uh, a two by four across the head would uh, would help. I mean, most um, political parties, when or individual candidates, when they when they sort of veer off the problem solving mode. Uh, change only when it looks uh, as if it isn't working. Um, uh, when they sense the public isn't buying what they're selling. So it's ultimately the public's responsibility to rein in uh, what if they see and view destructive behavior. But in our system, it's so complicated. Who do you hold accountable? Um, is it the president's economy? Uh, well, he has a he has some influence on it, but he certainly doesn't determine economic policy. Bob Woodward was laughable in writing that the problem with Obama is he didn't work his will on Congress. Uh, I thought, has this man read the Constitution? Does he have any sort of sense of uh, of president's range of operation and uh, and the like? Uh, so it means sometimes rather than saying, oh, we just have to come together, it means playing hardball, of being tough and explicit, of the public weighing in, and and then at the same time being open to members on the other side of the aisle who who share a interest in solving problems rather than realizing ideological goals or um, uh, or simply achieving a position of political power. Do you know the, the weird thing is if you look at uh, some of the areas where you could see a roadmap ahead these are perfectly compatible with positions that Republicans have taken for decades. You know, start with the, uh, infrastructure. We're at an incredible time where you can borrow money for nothing. And using that capability to take a crumbling infrastructure, which the entire business community in unison would say desperately needs to be refurbished and expanding it so that we have the ability to move goods and services uh, as quickly as possible and efficiently as possible. It's a slam dunk, uh, but it's tribal politics. So if he's for it, we're against it. So we haven't had that movement towards uh, infrastructure. You look at education. Uh, I can't imagine anything that Rahm Emanuel did in Chicago that otherwise you wouldn't have seen a long succession of Republicans do. And on education, Arne Duncan, the Secretary of Education, is in sync with most of what you'd find on the other side. Uh, the health policy, as many people have pointed out, uh, the Affordable Care Act is effectively the Republican alternative to Clinton Care in 1993-94, merged with the uh, Romney plan. Uh, the deficit reduction packages that are out there that point out that you can't uh, use austerity too uh, much in the short run or you'll send the economy down the toilet, but that you've got to find a balanced approach uh, over the long run are done by every bipartisan uh, commission that you can come up with, uh, not to mention people inside but it's tribalism that keeps us from doing it. So the problem right now is not a Republican Party that would normally uh, be able to find ways to stay within its general principles and yet find ways of solving problems. It's a party that's veered completely outside that normal process that views problem solving as something that, if it's done now, would benefit an incumbent president and therefore we won't do it. And that is something that may be resolved by an election, in part, but also has deeper roots. And uh, those deeper roots, uh, which is part of the reason that libertarians are so disaffected, but also the reason that standard issue conservative Republicans who are fiscal conservatives but social moderates, but by fiscal conservative means that people are looking towards actually reducing debt over the long run rather than just cutting taxes uh, no matter what, are uneasy with their party. And that's going to require wresting control back from a group of, a small group of radicals who dominate the primary process and who now dominate the money process as well. 
Yes. Um, I had a bullet in the class today, and my professor basically, we were talking about bullet listers for the entirety of it, and um, it was always a concept I was aware of, but the way he phrased it was basically that it has sort of given, it has posed such a threat to the idea of majority rule because it's now making it, it's not just 50 and 1 that you have to get something to pass through, it's 50 plus the threat of, you know, and it extends so much further, and it makes the majority can have can control what the majority does in a, in a sense. So I just, I want to know what, how, basically what we're supposed to do about the filibuster, what you think about it, and how it just poses such an extension to gridlock that it's well, your professor is correct, and uh, I'm delighted. Who is your professor? My professor in Oh. Yeah. Well, delighted to hear that. Uh, you know, most folks in the country are really are not aware of what what goes on in the Senate of the United States. The the framers anticipated both chambers operating by majority rule, they listed in the Constitution a set of exceptions to that for passing treaties and impeaching presidents and, and uh, a number of other things, but the assumption was uh, majority rule. It turns out uh, both House and Senate adopted a set of normal parliamentary procedures at the outset, which included a motion on the previous question. Parliamentary terms, that's a majority vote to cut off debate and proceed to vote. But in, was it 1809, 1805, and was it Aaron Burr? It was Aaron Burr. Vice President and uh, President of the Senate w decided to recodify the rules, to bring them up to standards, and he left out the motion uh, on the previous question, uh, figuring senators are statesmen. They wouldn't talk beyond the necessary time to talk, and, and so it was left out. While the House developed that procedure and over time came to operate by it, became a majoritarian institution. So there was the Senate with the capacity of individual members to talk and keep action from happening. Uh, but it wasn't utilized very much. A few times uh, in the 19th century and in the lead up to World War I, uh, there was a filibuster. President Wilson was outraged. He took it to the country and intimidated the Senate into passing a, a rules change uh, that set up cloture, supermajority way of ending debate and moving ahead. It's been revised over time. Last time was in 1975. Um, but for decades, it was used on occasion on civil rights legislation, on matters where the minority felt if they held the floor, took their case to the country, you know, opinion would change. But starting really in the late 60s and 70s, as the schedule of the Senate became more complex, uh, uh, it, it became a device uh, for individual members to begin to extract benefits. Uh, if they didn't agree to a unanimous consent agreement, it was dead in the water, so they had leverage to, to operate. Uh, then, over time, it became a device for the minority party to uh, insist uh, uh, that the majority get supermajority. And during during the most recent years, it has become routinized. In the late 60s, about 15% of all major legislation was subject to some kind of filibuster-related delay. In the current, huh? 15%. Uh, today, it's closer to 90 to 95%. Everything requires it. Uh, and you get filibusters and holes on matters that ultimately 
after you go through the arduous process of cloture, get u unanimous votes of approval or 99 to 1 or whatever. Uh, so it's used strategically as a device to slow things down, to keep anything from happening, and on matters of great import of simply stopping dead in the water. It's a, it's a huge abuse, and it makes the Senate the most dysfunctional legislative body in the country. We outline a, a reform agenda, not eliminating it completely, but but putting the burden on the those who would who would seek to hold up action. Uh, it really has the effect of uh, putting a burden on the filibustering party to to have 41 votes at all times that they can demonstrate as opposed to that on the majority party uh, uh, to come up with the 60 votes for cloture. We have other changes to restrict and contain it, but it's a, it's a massive problem and one that the press doesn't usually report. They just say, this measure failed. Well, it had 57 votes out of 100. In normal circumstances, that would be viewed as sufficient. So something can be done and uh, there's actually a lot of uh, action now among members, led by some of the junior members, like the Udall uh, cousins um, and Jeff Merkley and others, to to try, if Democrats retain a majority in the Senate, to try to revise those rules. Uh, and I hope that happens. Yes. say this is one of those areas it's a little bit like uh, same-sex relationships where uh, the you begin to see changes in uh, the public it takes a longer time for them to filter up to the top levels of the political arena and there are lots of reasons for it not to do so uh, and it's going to come through referendums and you see this you know you see a dramatic change in public attitudes on same-sex marriage uh, if you go back on that issue, uh, it wasn't that long ago we did a program with Howard Dean this morning, mm -hmm. of course, the governor of Vermont. Vermont was the first state to institute civil unions. And there was a huge public backlash in the next election. Uh, Democrats and Republicans who voted for civil unions were thrown out of office, and the sense was uh, this was an enormous setback. Just a few years later, if you simply stand up and say you're for civil unions, you are basically fighting against what is clearly a wave of, uh, of opinion. And it's not clear to me what will happen if medical marijuana to start with, uh, followed by marijuana more generally. But where you'll see that change happen is from the bottom up, not from the top down. Well, that's you'll see it cool. happen if you get more state referendums. And if following the passage of state referendums, either nothing bad happens, or potentially some things that people hadn't expected in a positive way happen. There's still a very strong strain in the uh, uh, community that has to deal with larger, you know, bigger problems and more pernicious drugs, or marijuana is a gateway drug. And what will happen over the long term is whether you can see through experimentation by the states, which is not necessarily a bad way to go, uh, whether that thesis, which has long been held, is in fact it's just that our, my observation has been that if you go to a lot of counties in the West, you will see that the prison school, the primary industry of the county, is basically the way to discharge veterans to job that has security and benefits. And people just don't know. 
know how to find them. I would say our entire drug policy uh, over a long period of time, including warehousing large numbers of people in prisons for minor drug offenses, has been a disaster. There's just no question about it. We brought people into prisons who shouldn't have been there and turned them into, in many cases, career criminals uh, as a consequence. We've begun to see some changes in that. We've begun to see the changes, especially as you see how different attitude on crack cocaine compared to uh, other protein which has clearly been used in a racially biased way. But it takes a long time, and frankly, there are some reasons you want to take a little bit of time, because these are not easy issues to deal with. Uh, look at other drugs. Yes? how the house There's no question but that the constitutional basis of representation of the states and the Senate to per state whatever the population and a further provision in the Constitution that requires unanimity to, uh, uh, to change that, uh, that was a result of a compromise uh, between small and large states. Uh, which, which had a lot also to do with uh, slavery uh, uh, that is with us today. Now, it turns out that um, it isn't as bad as it seems because there are a number of small states that are liberal. Uh, Rhode Island, uh, Delaware, uh, uh, sort of balance the uh, Idaho and Wyoming and uh, and the like. Uh, I mean, it's a flawed system of representation, but it's uh, there's been a lot of scholarship on that that suggests the bias isn't as great as it might otherwise seem. Uh, gerrymandering is a problem uh, in the House, but its impact is not always moving in one direction. It depends what the, what the wave of uh, statewide elections are in the election before the, the decennial census and redistricting. Sometimes Republicans, as was true in 2010, uh, win big and control more states, but in the past, occasionally Democrats have uh, benefited from that. In general, uh, gerrymandering is less important in terms of producing seats safe for one party or the other than the geographic sorting of, uh, of voters to like-minded uh, areas. Uh, it's really just stunning to see how people settle into communities with uh, people who think like them, you know, I think even in this state of New York, we could find a, uh, a sort of a Brooklyn uh, a community of like-minded people, but find something very different in parts of the suburbs or upstate uh, New York. And so even if you did fair districting, you know, contiguous and compact, you'd get overwhelming Democratic and and Republican uh, districts. So I think it's, I, I acknowledge that the, the uh, representational problems of the Senate, I acknowledge the reality of gerrymandering, but I don't, uh, they don't operate in isolation from these other very powerful forces. I, I view it a little bit more negatively in a couple of ways. I do think that the, the uh, uh, unrepresentativeness of the Senate, I'll just speak louder, the unrepresentativeness of the Senate in many issues has become a big problem. The, the small states just have way too much leverage. The problem, though, is uh, twofold. You imagine that the House 
balances that because of population. But keep in mind that the House was set up so that every state gets at least one representative. And we divide up the districts, limited to 435 since 1910, by state. So we have a Supreme Court that said, you know, when it comes to redistricting, when it comes to districts, what matters is one person, one vote. And we're gonna have a monomaniacal focus on one person, one vote. But it's a farce when you begin to look at the individual states. So you could have a state like Alaska that at some point may get 300,000 people with one vote in the House. And you're gonna have districts in New York when you go after a census that may have a million people. And you're getting more and more of these small states that are losing population, but they'll keep their representatives. And the idea that one person, one vote matters enough that in Pennsylvania, you'll throw out a redistricting plan because it deviates by 16 people out of 600,000. But you can have a district where the power of 300,000 people is three times that of another district in another bigger state. So the power of smaller states or sparsely populated areas is going to grow over time because these disparities are growing. And at some point, either the Supreme Court is going to have to confront it and say, one person, one vote needs to be adjusted because it isn't working. We're going to have to maybe adjust the Constitution to create some at-large seats or something to create a different uh, balance. Or we're going to have to live with a reality that uh, there's a lot more leverage with people who live in sparsely populated areas. Maybe that'll get more people moving to North and South Dakota to have more power. Okay. Who's going to ask it? Okay, I'll ask it. Um, who am nope. I? Why am I here? Yeah, <laughs> Admiral Stockdale, we're coming up to the debates. Who am I and why am I here? The one thing we haven't talked about, Norm, is the media. And our book is, uh, is, is sort of filled with uh, arguments about, uh, about the media and the problematics of it, which are really quite different than the general, general take. Why don't you take a cut at that? <laughs> okay. And I'll give you this one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we deal with in the book at uh, length that we dealt with in this uh, op-ed piece that Tom mentioned in the Washington Post uh, really is the failure of our mass media now to uh, grapple with the, the level of problems that we have. And, you know, so, uh, it's, it takes place at so many different levels. Uh, some part of it is the challenge that comes with these dramatic changes that have occurred in technology that affect all of us in so many different ways. But uh, newspapers don't have a business model anymore. Uh, we've had surveys for years that show that younger people aren't reading newspapers, they aren't buying newspapers. They, if they get their information, they get it online. If they read newspapers, they read them online. So they've gone to online models, but they don't have business models that bring in the revenue there. Television networks used to dominate. We now live in a world where Fox News, with an audience at any given time of uh, two and a half million people, earns more net profits <coughs> by far than all three network news divisions with an audience of 30 million people. So they found a business model, as MSNBC has, and the rest are floundering. And some of it has to do with the amplification of the social media. So the business models often that work are tribal business models. Uh, they're partisan media, but very different than what we used to have in the 19th century because of the reach and immediacy and 24-hour cycles and depth. And uh, it's made the media basically uh, not find good ways of reporting on what's reality out there. Some of it too is that organizations have developed over the last 25 or 30 years on the left and right that are watchdogs that try and keep everybody from dissing their own side. So anything that hints of bias, they get slammed for it and reporters are just paranoid about being accused of bias. So false equivalence, the notion that everybody's to blame, the idea that your, your job is to report both sides, not to report the truth, is endemic in the press corps that is called the mainstream media. And then you put that together with those on either side who believe that the job is to report a side. And then you throw in a social media that can have 
lies reported and amplified all over the place. I had I was at giving a talk in California yesterday and somebody came up to me and said, you know, I've gotten 50 times this email that says that Warren Buffett had said that, you know, here's what we need to do. We, uh, we need to uh, cut off the pay for anybody who doesn't vote for a balanced budget. Stop this process where members of Congress get the full pension from the day they enter office for the rest of their lives, giving them the gold-plated health care and all these other things. And I said, you know, Warren Buffett never said any of that, and he's reported it many times, and it's all a bunch of lies to begin with. And he looked stricken. He said, you know, my best friend sent me this, and it seems so obvious. You know, how do you exist in a world like that? It's very difficult, but the fact is, when you get a situation like the one we reported, where you have polarization, but we have asymmetric polarization, and where things like the filibuster are being used in ways they haven't been used before. And voters are relying on reporters to tell them what's going on and they're not getting a story. It makes our job much harder. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.